Okay, you have an outline that has to do with the faithfulness of God. How many of y'all believe that you can count on God for anything at any time? Amen. That's a fact, Jack. That's what Uncle Si said. And it works. We can trust him anytime, all the time. Well, it's wonderful to have scripture and saints of, uh, of the Lord hanging around in your home, uh, even in your, if you have an office or somewhere. Just a reminder. Got to get God involved in everything. Yes. Oh, it's bad. Yep. My son said, uh, if they don't do it right, you tell them they're going to get you in the train. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably try to patch it. But, you know, well, let's pray about that. And then little Axel has uh, got an infection. We need to be praying for him. Yeah. Now, he's going to turn two next month. Yeah. Or is he turning three? Okay. He's two. He'll be two. Yeah, I know it's on my list for next month. Uh, I, think he's, I think he's in August. He's yeah. Two. Yeah, it's on my list for August. Yeah. Okay. And she's, she's yeah, she told she's me that. Oh, yeah. Girl. Yeah, y'all pray she has a girl. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's bow our heads. Father God, we want to thank you first of all that you are our God of faithfulness all the time. You're always there for us. And so, Lord, today we come before you acknowledging you and praising you for who you are and how who you are has affected our lives and our families. And we specifically want to pray for Linda Brush today that you continue to give her recovery, uh, speedy healing, and, Father God, that she get back into what she loves doing, and that's teaching children and being in worship. And we thank you for her and her family. Father, just continue that hedge of protection through the name and blood of Jesus around her and her family. And we just thank you, Lord, for the outcome. Father, we lift up little Axel to you today with this infection that it would clear up in the name and blood of Jesus. And Father, over this event, with this home, uh, with this leakage, Father, we ask for divine intervention there. And now, Lord, we just ask you to open up the ears of our hearts to receive the engrafted word to our soul. And thank you, Lord, for the comfort that the word of God gives to us, the assurance that it gives to us in our everyday lives and all the things that take place. That we always be faithful to you because you're always faithful to us. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' precious and holy name, and everybody said... Now, in your bulletin there, the first scripture that I'm using is the foundation for this study on the faithfulness of God. And it's 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. 
it says, but the Lord is faithful. Who shall establish you and keep you from evil? Now, the word faithful means that God is always true to his word. And so we need to be that way when we're faithful to him that we're true to his word as well. And the word established there, uh, if you have some new translations of your Bible, you may have the word strength or cause to stand or make you firm or fix you. And it has to do with strengthening you with the power that he gives to his people. And uh, it causes us to make a stand because Jesus wants us to stand on his word in everything we do and say in life. And then the word keep is a military word that has to do with being a guard or a sentry. And, and that word is there because of his divine protection for us. He's always faithful to protect us in everything that we're going through. I always tell people when you get on the American highway, you better pray that God's angels go with you because that's one of the most dangerous places in the world is an American highway. And, huh? Especially for most. Oh, okay. So that's a guard, a sentry, so it's protection that he always gives. And then the word evil, in your modern day translations, they may have the word evil one. And it's talking about the wicked one. So that means Satan and the demonic forces, the kingdom of darkness. God protects us because we belong to him and the blood of Jesus covers us all the time. Can anybody say praise the Lord? Because without that, we would have absolutely no hope. All right, so let's look. I looked uh, at some words uh, when you do a study like this on faithfulness of God and how it applies to us in our everyday life. So I looked in the book of Psalms and I found quite a few uh, words in the concordance that dealt with this. So I selected a few. In Psalm 36 and verse five. Now, this is a Psalm written by David and he's revealing his, his service to the Lord and how faithful God is to him. And uh, I would like to actually add a verse to this. I, I put in your bulletin verse five, but I would like to add verse one. The transgression of the wicked saith when within my heart, there is no fear of God before his eyes. So people who are wicked have no faith in God and his word and they don't realize and of course don't want the faithfulness of God because they don't fear him and have any belief in him nor do they respect his authority. We're living in a society today that's that way. But we're not supposed to be that way. So verse 5 says, Thy mercy, O Lord. Now the word mercy has to do with God's love and forgiveness and acceptance of us and that's because of his salvation, what he's done for us. So it's his mercy. So David knew about the mercy of God, which he needed, which we need all the time. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. So what is he meaning about that? That God is sovereign, he's infinite, he's the creator, and he's unlimited. So when you go to the Lord, you can always count on him that whatever the need is at the time, he's got the source and supply and all you got to do is trust him. Hold on to him. Have confidence in his care. Because he created you and put you here for a reason. He's got a plan for you. And that's why you can always go to him and you're going to know God is a faithful God. David understood that. All right, let's go over to Psalm 89. You see, a lot of times in the events of life, uh, sometimes stuff gets so... Uh, oppresses us and stresses us out and what have you. We get worried and fear, all that kind of stuff. And we need to know that God has got us, that I can count on the Lord, that he's always faithful. And God doesn't let us down. Now, circumstances sometimes and, and your anticipations and all that kind of stuff, uh, we can let ourselves down, but I want you to know God is in whatever you're going through. He's in the middle of it with you because he's faithful. All right, so look at Psalm 89. We're going to look at verse 2. His faithfulness is established. 
It's a foundation for us. And uh, verse 2 says, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithful shall uh, thou establish in the very heavens. So he's talking about an establishment of his faith. In verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. So when we understand that God has established us in his faith, and our foundation that we stand on is the faith he's put in us, and guess who that is? It's Jesus. He's the rock. He's our foundation, and we can count on him. And he's in the word established there in the Hebrew is an interesting word. It means God is unchangeable. In other words, if he said it, he's going to do it. If he said it, you can believe it. If he said it, he's going to carry through. Just like the prophetic word that we're seeing being fulfilled all over the world today, God's prophecy is being fulfilled because Jesus is going to be on his way back very soon. And we need to be ready for that. I'm putting a sermon together right now about are God's people ready for the Lord's return? And I'll be giving that to you very soon. <clears throat> now let's go to verse 8 of Psalm 89. And we see that God's faithfulness is incomparable. It says, O Lord, the God of hosts, who is a strong Lord, who is strong, Lord, like unto you? Well, none. There's nobody else as strong as God. Nobody else as strong as the Lord God. Or thy faithfulness round about thee. Who is faithful like you? Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. There's not a person in this world that you can 100% depend on. There's not anything in this world, especially governments, that you can depend on. Our dependence has to be only on God and him alone. Amen? Because God and his word are unchangeable. Everything else changes by the moment. Nothing stays the same in this world. But you can count on God because his faithfulness. And it says... O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints in verse 5. In verse 8, uh, is backing that up. O God of hosts, who is strong like you? And thy faithfulness round about thee. Thy rulest the raging of the sea when the waves thereof arise. And if you read the rest of this chapter, it's talking about how God rules. He created everything, and he's got it in, in, under his control. Not man. Man does not have weather or the world or creation under his control. God has got it under his control. Amen. It is stupid to think that man has control of things in this world. God created this world. He owns it. It's his. It's not yours. And you're going to see that when the stuff starts coming down and he brings judgment on this world. The book of Revelation, if you don't, if you don't understand about prophetic word and what's fixing to happen, I would suggest to you to get in the book of Revelation and study it because you're fixing to see with your own eyes the things that are going to take place. I personally believe God is just about fed up with this world and the way it's going. And when he was that way before, he destroyed the world by a flood. And scientifically, they have proven that there was water on the face of this whole earth at one time. And the Bible talks about that, and science has proved it. <clears throat> now, go down to verse 33 of Psalm 89. This verse shows you that God's faithfulness never fails. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor my faithfulness to fail. I will always be, you know, the, the thing about God is it's hard to understand. His, his love is something you just can't really comprehend. No matter how we treat God, the things that we do and say, and even we belong to him and covered by the blood and, and we're born again, we're in the family of God and going to heaven, we still don't get it right all the time. Amen? Did you know God's faithfulness still will not fail you? We fail him, but he never fails us. So his faithfulness is unfailing. You can count on him. 
There's sometimes in life, through those dark days, that you wonder, where is God? Why is all this happening at once? Well, you go back to his word and he says, I am faithful and I will be faithful to you. My faith will never fail. My faithfulness is there for you. So let's back that up with Psalm 119. Now this is the longest psalm in the Bible and this is one of the chapters of the Bible that talks about the word of God and using a lot of terms about ordinances, precepts, uh, commandments, rules and all those things that have to do with God's word given us the principles to live by. Psalms 119, I would like to look at verse 89 and 90. Psalms 119, verse 89 and 90. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There, no matter what goes on, I don't care what country says they don't believe in God and, and they don't believe in the Bible, and I don't care what politician says they don't believe in God, they don't believe in the Bible. The thing is this, look what the Bible says in verse 89. Forever, forever, the word of God is settled. It will never change to suit your own doings. God will never change his word. It's forever settled. And there's several scriptures that tell us this in the Bible. You know, it seems like to me God could say something once and we'd get it. But it seems like uh, we, sometimes we just don't get it the first time. All right, so we can stand firm then. God's word is standing firm because it's heavenly and it's forever. So we could stand firm on the word of God and not go wrong. Is that right? Absolutely. Thy faithfulness, verse 90, thy faithfulness is, that means it's a fact, unto all generations. Thou hast established, there's that word again that means unchangeable, the earth and it abides. There is going to be a day, it talks about it in Second Peter, that God will destroy this earth by fire. First time he did it by flood, that's why we have the, the rainbow. I saw two the other day over here in, in, the, in the sky, one on top of each other, just, you know, that was spaced out. But I, I said, you know, that's pretty rare when I can see two at the same time like that. I kind of, Lord, are you trying to tell me something or what? I know what I was telling myself was, Lord, we've had too much rain, all these 40 inches or whatever it was the last few months. But anyway, the next time that this earth will be destroyed is by fire, but thank God there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth nothing but righteousness. So those that don't want righteousness, you're not going to get righteousness. You're going to get unrighteousness forever in a place that's going to be burning with hell, fire, forever. And that's because of the choices people made to reject God, his word, and his his Savior, His Son, the Lord Jesus. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations, and thou hast established the earth, and it abides. Can anybody say amen? amen? So God is always faithful to us, and we need to be faithful to Him. Now in your bulletin, we'll finish this out with the scriptures that I've got written in your bulletin. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 is a very good example of a man Paul, and he said this just before he was executed for his service to the Lord. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Now, what was his course? He was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 9 by Jesus and called by Jesus to serve him as a, an apostle missionary. And he went all over the world three different times, spreading the gospel and establishing churches, establishing uh, men to be in positions in those churches as deacons and, and pastors and elders and teachers. So he finished his course, but a few Sundays ago, I gave you the evidence from his own mouth that Paul said of all the things that he went through 
and his service for the Lord. So now he knows he's fixing to be executed. But he knew he had finished the mission that God had put him on. He learned all about submission to God's authority. You see, the word submission is important in the believer's life and the disciple's life. You have to learn. Sub means to come underneath. Mission is your purpose, your plan that God has for you. So you're learning submission to God's plan, to his authority. And when we do, your life is fulfilled, and it gets to be fulfilling in the way you live it, like Paul understood and died fulfilled. Isn't that something? When you get ready to die, can you say this about your life? I fulfilled what God told me to do. I fulfilled what God called me to do. Can you say that? I hope that when somebody preaches your funeral, they can say they fulfill the will of God in their life. And he did all this because of God's anointing on him. He didn't do this by self-effort and performance. That's one thing that he taught in the book of Romans, that this Christian experience is not by performance. He taught it also in Galatians, because I quote it all the time, Galatians 2.20. It's not the I that did it, but it's Christ in me that did it. That's important. Because anytime you're in a performance mode of Christianity, you're not in the will of God, and you're not happy, and you have no joy, no peace. Because you left the anointing, you left God's plan of how to walk with him and try to do it on your own, and you're going to fall flat on your face. I don't care if you're in ministry or whatever's going on, sitting in the church. You cannot perform Christianity. It's Jesus, the in-living Christ, but the out-living Christ. That's real Christianity, the in-living and the out-living. And it's done by his ability. What do we do? We yield, present, and surrender ourselves to that life. And we should be doing it moment by moment, day by day, all the time. So when you look at this verse, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. I know some people who belong to this church right here that are not keeping the faith. Had been in this church in years, some months, out wandering in the world. Try to reach people like that and, of course, let me tell you what happens though most of the time when I do that. I get the blame for them being out of church. <laughs> it's amazing to me. I spent 54 years in the funeral business, and all the time that there were mistakes at funerals, you know I got the blame for it? The manager of the funeral home, the funeral director, when mistakes were made. Same thing being a pastor in a church. When things go wrong, you know who gets the blame for it? The pastor does. <laughs> so I'm, I'm being faithful to the Lord in this call. But well, sometimes I feel like Paul and all the stuff that he went through to finish the course. Amen? But in the end, in the end, it will be worth it all because we'll be with Jesus. So be faithful. God is faithful. So be faithful to him in whatever he's called you to do. No matter the persecution, no matter the opposition, you keep faithful to what God has called you to do with your life. So I gave a few notes about this. It says, keep the faith, be faithful. And how do you do that? What way do you do it? Stay obedient to the faith God's put in you. The ramus, the spoken word, the spirit of God put in you. Be faithful to it. Pass the faith you've learned on to somebody else. Did you know you can pass that on? You live it and then you speak it. You teach it to others. Uh, a lot of us have got grandkids and great-grandkids and children and relatives and friends and neighbors. They need to hear a word of faith from your mouth. The world, all it gives to them is lies and junk. They, if they look at the world to have hope, there is none. We have it and we need to be speaking it by faith. Then I, I got a statement here. Self-sacrifice is the delight of giving the best we have to the one we love the most, and that should be Jesus. If you love anything else more than Jesus in this life, you've got an idol. 
God hates idolatry, by the way. That's in Exodus 20. Self-sacrifice is the delight of giving the best we have to the one we love the most, and that's Jesus. Not people or things or money or prestige or anything else you can do or try to obtain, but it's Jesus. He's what it's all about. Now, I'm going to give you three scriptures here that show you that you can put faith in God and his word and God's power and God's anointing will carry it out. He will fulfill it. One of them is Psalms 138.2. This is an amazing statement that he makes about himself in Psalm 138.2. I will worship toward thy holy temple, said David, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. And David said this about God, that he knew about God. This is how intimate he was with the Lord and the Lord was with him. Thou, he's talking about God, thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. Now, that's amazing to me. God has magnified his word above his name. How do you do that? Well, God's the one that does it. And David knew about it. You see, you've got to realize something about that statement. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it says, Jesus and the word is the same. So God and the word is the same. So when you're looking at the Bible and you're, you're learning from the Bible and you're getting the, the revealed Bible to your heart and your spirit and your life, you're actually getting God. That's amazing to me. And then another one that you and I need to start claiming more is Jeremiah 1.12. God said, I watch over my word to perform it. So listen to this. If you're faithful to the word of God and you've, you've got that word going by faith, you're trusting in God's word that he's faithful to his word, God said, I'm going to watch over that word. Whether you put it in you or you gave it to somebody else, he says, I'm going to watch over that word. I'm going to perform that word in your life and in the life of the people that you gave it to. That's a promise that you and I have right there. You are not wasting time in giving God's word out because we got a promise. Another one that is powerful in Isaiah 55, 11, this is one when I was a Gideon for four years back in the 70s. We use this as the theme of the ministry of the Gideons and we went out and placed Bibles in hospitals and hotels and schools uh, nursing homes, uh, funeral homes, everywhere we could, we would place the Word of God. And I was amazed. Uh, if people took them up out of hotels and motels, we didn't care. That, that's what we wanted because they didn't cost us very much. Those Bibles lasted on, on an average of about seven, seven years per Bible. So you know, you're not wasting money and time when it, it's in the Word of God because here's the promise that backs this up. It's a Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Why does God send his word out to the world for salvation? Reveals himself through his son Jesus. That there is a rescue. God's rescue plan is going on. There's, there's been a Savior that's come to this world that died on the cross for everybody's sins. Nobody has to stay lost. Nobody has to say, uh, stay uh, without hope. Because God is sending forth his word through us. Through his Bible that's being spread all over the world. With that message of salvation. And he's promised in his word that when you take the word out, I'm going to do something with it in somebody's life, and I'm going to bring them in. 
And God does. He convicts people when they get in the word of God and they respond to God or they can say no to God. I hope to God that people understand God's love and grace and patience because he is loving and gracious. But he's got another side to him of justice because there's a place called heaven and there's a place called hell. And people will be making choices as to where their life will be in eternity. It'll be with God or without God. But the word of God tells us that he loves us. He's provided a way out, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important to understand that when God's word goes forth, it's not gonna be returning to him empty. He's gonna accomplish his will in that word in people's lives. I'm a result, you're a result. Somebody gave you the word at some time in your life, somebody prayed for you, you wouldn't be saved and you wouldn't be sitting here today. So God was faithful to his word that somebody put to work on our behalf. Amen? Amen? And we can give him thanks and honor and praise for it. So, is God always faithful? Yes. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for your faithfulness. That at some time during our existence, you called us through your word but it was a messenger that brought it. It was the Holy Spirit that anointed, the Holy Spirit that convicted to bring us to salvation, to Jesus. Not church membership, this is not about church. This is about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that he is faithful and he brings us one by one to the cross to know and love the Lord God through his son Jesus. Because when we get saved, we get filled with his love, his grace, and with faith that we too can be faithful. Faithful to you, Lord. And we thank you for it, and we praise you for it. Thank you for your patience, and your love, and your grace, and your sacrifice of your son on the cross for us. If there's somebody out there today, you're not sure that you've been born again. You can't tell a, a time or place when you ask Jesus to come in your life to be your personal Lord and Savior. So you don't have a full assurance. There's some doubt in your heart about whether you're going to be in heaven or hell when you die. So if I was a person that didn't have assurance right now, I would be asking Jesus to come in my life and truly be my Lord and my Savior and give me assurance of being saved. Perhaps if you already know that, but yet there's something lacking in your life today. Perhaps you haven't been faithful to the Lord in your walk with him, faithful to uh, your local assembly of believers, of attending a local church. Perhaps you have not shared Jesus and the word with another human being, and you've been putting it off. Do you know today is the day, now is the time to make a commitment, Lord, I want to be a faithful disciple. I want to be faithful of living your word and of putting your word to work in other people's lives. Just open up doors for me to share your word that I might be faithful to your call to be a servant, to be a fisher of men as Jesus has called us to be. And help me in these last days when times get harder and persecution comes more fierce that I won't fall away, that I'll be faithful to you and your word and continue to be a servant at all cost. So help us, Lord, in these days to live faithfully for you, to bring you honor and pleasure in all that we say and do. And we thank you for that. We praise you for it because we ask it in the sweet, lovable name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.